We are greeting all Burger Kids. As you can see today, and especially as you can hear today, for the first time in our series, we switched from Slovak language into English. And the reason is obvious. We have a very special guest today who is not a Slovak speaker because he's not a Slovak. Uh, and now I'm hoping I will get your name right. It's Kilian O'Donaghy. Very close. Kilian O'Donaghy. But don't have. <laughs> Kilian <laughs> O'Donaghy. Okay. Kilian is coming from Brussels, but as you can guess, he's not Belgian, he's Irish and uh, he's working. Uh, and again, now it will be difficult. Eurometox? Eurometo? Eurometo. So Eurometo. It's a French, uh... French version of Eurometal, let's say. Exactly. <laughs> uh, which is, uh, and now you can jump in and uh, describe uh, who you are, what you do and where you do it. Very good. Well, firstly, thanks for the, uh, thanks for the invitation. So I'm Kilian O'Donoghue. I am Director of Climate Energy at Eurometal. So Eurometal, we're the European Association of Non-Ferrous Metals Producers. And Non-Ferrous Metals is aluminium, copper, nickel, zinc. You also have silicone, ferro alloys. And you also have all the kind of, all the small metals that you need in an iPhone. You know, cobalt, lithium, you need in batteries. We are also uh, responsible for those producers. So I'm based in Brussels. I've been in Brussels for over 10 years now. And I've been with Eurometal for o- over five. Before that, I was uh, working for Fleischmann Hillard, a lobby firm. And before that, I was briefly in the, the European Commission working on gas projects. So that's my that's my background. So you know the battlefield from both sides? I know the battlefield from both sides. And I know to what it's like to be lobbied from the other side as well. Yeah, yeah, you could say that. Yeah. So maybe maybe you can start. Uh, why there is a, a special association for uh, non-ferrous metal? So why just not be everybody joined in one big family with uh, all the steel makers? Very good question. Um, well, firstly, there, there are different production processes and there's also different interests. So my job is to represent the interests of my producers. And I think the feeling would be that if you had a joint steel and non-ferrous metals association, the interests of non-ferrous metals producers wouldn't be adequately represented. So basically we split and you have a Eurofair, which represents a steel association, and I represent non-ferrous metals. And then if I go a bit deeper, the production process is very different. To simplify, when you make non-ferrous metals, so aluminium, zinc, etc., you use a huge amount of electricity. Yeah, About 40% of the cost is just electricity. Um, when you make steel, eh, you have different ways of making it. But by and large, with the most common way called the vertical integrated route, you use much more cooking coal, coke we call it, uh, and much less electricity. So it's very different interests, and that's why we have different associations representing. Uh, but I should say I do work quite a lot with Eurofair, with the Steel Association. We try and combine interests where possible. So I hope that... Uh, Kind of explains. So, so you said you are wo- working in a part of your organization. You are dealing with the climate issues and energy issues. So, uh, uh, how did you um, uh, respond it, or what were your first uh, thoughts uh, when you heard the proposals for new green deal and these uh, ambitious goals proposed by European Commission? Okay. Well, it was a good question. First thing I would say is it's a long process. Yeah, it's not like a proposal happens in the morning. We know kind of, we know what what's coming. Um, so what I would say is this probably started three years back. So we kind of how it happened was we agreed for a forty percent target, so you reduce greenhouse gas emissions by twenty thirty, back in what was that two thousand and twelve I think, and mm-hmm. then basically we agreed that actually. Actually, no, we agreed that. We finalized that in 2016. Then what happened since is we said that given the Paris discussions, we would need to reach climate neutrality. That means you have kind of a a net zero by 2050. So that was agreed. Then what we said was when we go with climate neutrality for 2050, if we stick with 40% for 2030, that's not going to be enough. So we need to increase it. So about three years ago, the European Commission, they came to us 
and they said we are going to increase ambition. That is what the member states want. Uh, and they kind of asked us as well, saying, as industry, what you need in the transition and what can you do? So that's kind of how it worked. And then the actual proposal, which was, I think, the 14th of July this year, that's almost the, the end of the beginning of a process because mm -hmm. it's kind of, you know what's going to come. There's all discussions. And now what's happening without going too much detail with the process is the European Commission have said, this is our proposal. This is what we want for 2030, 55% target. And now it's on the member states and the MEPs, that's the politicians in Brussels, to agree. And that usually takes maybe 18 months, two years, sometimes 12 months. So that's kind of the, the process. So if you haven't met the original goal in 2016, but 2020, does it mean that the goal for 2030 would be uh, less ambitious? So we met the, so we set a goal of 20% by 2020 and we met that. Mm -hmm. What we did then was we set a goal of 40% for 2030, mm -hmm. but we set that in 2016. Mm -hmm. But then we said in 2020 that the 40% is not enough and we have to go to 55%. Mm -hmm. If you're asking me, is there a big difference between 40% or 55%, there's a massive difference. Yeah, this is this is what we would like you to explain this this difference because for m many people for the audience it's like forty or fifty five uh, it's like uh, numbers that do not uh, carry any information for them. Okay, so the first thing, in kind of simplistic terms, it's a massive change and it's, it's very dramatic. So, if look at it today, twenty twenty, and then you want to get to zero by twenty fifty. Switching from 40 to 55% is a major change. To put it into numbers, you, if you're at 40%, that means between 2020 and 2030, every year, you reduce your emissions by 2.2%. Mm -hmm. If you go for 55%, you change it to 4.2%. So that means Double. out of the economy, you're taking, you're reducing emissions 4.2%, okay? If you have economic growth, which we hope for, then you're reducing it even more. Mm -hmm. I should also say that the 2020 target, it's important to understand that given the economic crisis, it became much easier to hit the 2020 target because we had less economic growth. Mm -hmm. So if we see economic growth, hopefully post COVID we will see that, and we're having a growing economy and we have to reduce emissions, it's it's a major challenge. Mm. Yeah. Technically, how is it done? Because as you said, uh, in case of aluminium and probably some other uh, uh, metals, it's mainly about the electricity. So generally the emissions uh, are based on where are you m producing the electricity. So how you as a producer can influence uh, your carbon emissions? What, what are the processes or what are the technical solutions to reduce carbon emissions from, for example, aluminium production? Okay, so, so I'm going to focus now on industry, how reduce emissions, just in terms of sectors of the economy. I would just say there's the agriculture sector, there's the farming sector, there's the buildings, there's the transport. And now I'll focus on industry. But basically, we need all these sectors to contribute and reduce emissions, and also electricity sector, obviously. So for ourselves, if you look at industry and industry decarbonizing, in simplistic terms, I would say you probably need two revolutions, okay? You need industry to electrify as much as possible. So anything which can switch from carbon to electricity should switch. Then you need to decarbonize electricity. Okay, In Slovakia, you're not doing too bad. I think about 70% is between uh, nuclear and hydro. So you're, you're doing pretty good. And I know you have some coal, but they're coming offline over time. So Slovakia is on the right direction. So hypothetically, if you decarbonize power and your industries switch to electricity, you're making huge progress. So that's the that's the idea. Then what you have also is you have direct emissions. So that's your direct kind of carbon emissions. And there's a range of different technologies there to get us to kind of reduce emissions there. The most common, which would be discussed a lot, is CCS. That's carbon capture and storage. So that you take the CO2, mm -hmm. put it under the ground. Progress on that has been very slow. That's I just have to be honest about that. Progress has been very slow. What we talked, what we thought back in 2005 of the potentials haven't, haven't been realized. That's one technology which has been very slow. But there's other things, for example, you can switch to, to biomass, you can switch to biosources, yeah? 
there's all these range of different technologies. When I speak of aluminium, we have technologies where you can change the inert anode process uh, for what you use. You wouldn't use cooking coal. You would use something else, a ceramics type material, which would reduce emissions. I didn't so, understand. So that this this is quite <laughs> yeah sorry. So this this is kind of quite technical. This kind of going into the the nerdy kind of uh, we have our innovation officers who love these kind of things. But basically, instead of using cooking coal, uh, you would use something else which uh, is renewable and which wouldn't leave a high CO2 footprint, mm -hmm. okay? So that's just a list of some of the technologies on the direct emissions, okay? And just to, to kind of summarize it, you have scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. Scope one emissions is your direct emissions, what you emit at the, the plant straight mm -hmm. away, which tends to be your- you your, know, your chimney. Your, yeah, exactly. Then your scope two is your electricity and your scope three is your transport of and all the other things around it. Scope three are usually quite small. So moving as much from scope one to increase scope two and ensuring that scope two is decarbonized is probably the simplest way to go. So a huge amount is on electricity sector. That's a, a long answer to a... Yeah. You know, both of us took a, uh, took a deep breath because we wanted probably to say the, the same thing. Uh, as you mentioned, elec electricity is the key. And yep. in Slovakia, we have quite a green electricity. I think it's even close to 80% uh, of CO2-free electricity. With renewables. Or, or with renewables uh, yeah, with renewables. And the coal is really going uh, offline slowly. Uh, however, uh, our producers don't really have an advantage of uh, being uh, fed by these uh, power plants because they are working in a, on a they are buying electricity on a regional market. Mm, it's uh, they are buying it uh, via the the Prague uh, power exchange, and it's the whole region: uh, Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia, Poland, Hungary, and probably some others. Uh, so when they are buying electricity, they are it's probably coming from the Slovak power plants, but they are they have the regional price, which uh, accounts also for the Czech coal plants uh, and uh, the Polish coal plants and and similar. So. Actually, being in a country with a, a low carbon electricity source doesn't make any difference to the producers. W what you can say about this? Yep. Um, well, it's the big issue. And I think you need to differentiate between the power producers and then the electro intensive users. Okay. So the people who buy the electricity. And what you say is very true. So, what we have in Europe is we have the integrated electricity market. Yeah. And as you said, here in Slovakia, you're connected, you have interconnections with Czech Republic, ex Poland, etc. What that means is that the CO2 is priced often at your interconnector, yeah, as the power exchange, etc. So what that means is if you're an aluminium plant, which uh, operates off hydro, or even if you're buying for the Slovak grid with 80% CO2 free electricity, you still face a high CO2 price. And that's because we have the marginal pricing system of electricity in Europe. So it's not based on the average CO2, which in Slovakia is extremely low. It's less than 0.2. It's based on the marginal, which is the last unit. What that means is a Slovak aluminium plant, when they buy uh, electricity, they're paying CO2 based on fossil fuel, even though they're consuming uh, renewable sources. Yeah. So that's, that's just a consequence of the electricity market design we've set up and a consequence of the emissions trading system. And some people benefit from it, but those who lose from it and are hit very hard are your electro-intensive users. That's a phenomenon which is not just in Slovakia. It's the same when I speak of, uh, I have large Norwegian members who have lots of aluminium in, in Norway based on hydro plants. They face a very high CO2 cost. And even though Norway is, you know, it's 99% uh, decarbonized electricity, there is interconnectors with Denmark, with Germany, so there's coal, which sets the price, which means they pay the CO2 component. So that's the reason. The solution, what we say is you have a system of what's called indirect compensation. So you can get compensated for that cost to prevent carbon leakage. That is uh, something which the, lots of member states provide to the electro intensive industry to say, okay, you face this cost, you're exposed to global competition we will compensate you a percentage of this cost. So for Slovakia, you can't avoid the CO2 cost, your, your users, but you can hypothetically avail of the compensation. 
that's a discussion between uh, your ministries and your industry but that is something which happens elsewhere we have it i represent uh, members all over europe and there's 17 18 compensation systems throughout europe and they get uh, compensation up to the maximum level which without being too technical is it's 75 percent up to up to a percentage of their of their use 0.5 percent gva and that's too much detail but that's kind of the, so the idea this was the part of the original proposal like if we want to establish a market with uh, carbon permits the european commission expected uh, that this can happen that uh, companies that have uh, minimum direct emissions will have to pay the cost for co2 emissions it was uh, when was it implemented this indirect compensation that's a it's a very good uh, question so the compensation system is in place since 2012 okay and um, the indirect impact so aluminum joined the european trading system fully in 2012 uh, so since then they've been exposed to that cost and um, if you're asking me was this all thought through in the design of the scheme there's kind of two different things there's we want the power sector to decarbonize so you need to have a carbon price signal in power so we want to switch from coal to gas. Mm -hmm. So you say we need a CO2 price of 50 euros a ton. That makes coal less competitive. It makes gas more competitive. That is the idea. We also want uh, direct emissions, so coal to be used yeah, less. So that means the CO2 price will signal that. Then who's caught in the middle is probably the electro-intensive industry who are the electricity producers are saying, I'm going to pass this fully on to them. Of course they will because they can sell to wherever they want. And then we get, well, they get hit in the middle. So that's a consequence of this scheme. So they're just a bit unlucky, I guess, with the design and they're caught in the middle of this process. Mm -hmm. mm. I should say, just to, to fully clarify, is when you look at the whole picture, you know, the electricity sector is massive, then direct emissions are much more common than indirect emissions. It's just that you have a small, mm -hmm. very important mm -hmm. sector of electrointensive mm -hmm. industry, which I happen to, to represent. Mm -hmm. And uh, how does the international competition look like? I mean, ex uh, European Union, because the usual story is uh, all these costs will cause uh, the uh, European producers to phase out or probably close completely, and Chinese or some other imports will just replace them. Yeah, so the international picture is not very good, if I'm very honest. Um, in Europe, uh, 11. Uh, aluminum smelters have, have closed since 2008. It's like uh, factories or uh, more factories, like 11 businesses or... So they're the factories. So you have the the big installations, which is the primary aluminum. Mm -hmm. the, they, they have closed. Um, in 2008, China was 10% of global aluminum production, 10. Today, they are over 60%. Okay, 60. Over 60. Over 60. A strategic decision was made by the Chinese government that we are going to invest heavily in uh, energy intensive industry, in particular strategic metals. And that's not just for aluminium. When I speak of zinc, when I speak of copper, when I speak of nickel, it's the exact same thing. And steel, of course. And steel, of course. Uh, so that's kind of the situation. There's a huge production of Chinese aluminium. There's also an overcapacity. So they produce more than they use and they can flood the European market. And that, that's more a trade question than a yeah. climate and energy question, but they can flood the European market. The same with steel. Exactly. So just steel is the same thing. You have these uh, trade defense cases to stop the, the mm -hmm. dumping, anti-dumping cases. So that's the kind of global picture. A huge, massive increase in Chinese production. I think it's also very, very important to understand that Chinese aluminium or Chinese metals is by and large made based on coal. So if I speak of aluminium, 88% of uh, aluminium made in China is made based on coal, okay? 12% coal is like electricity, you mean? Coal, coal, based, coal based electricity. Why that matters is it's a, <laughs> it matters a lot. A ton of aluminium made in Europe, in average, is uh, under seven tons of CO2. Made in Slovakia, it's even lower. It's about four tons of CO2. Including in, the electricity. Including used. the electricity. So I'm counting the scope one, I'm counting the scope two, okay? So four tons uh, in Slovakia. In China, it's 21 tons of CO2. It's because it's coal compared to uh, nuclear and hydro, it's a massive difference. So 
if you think about it logically, and we're talking about uh, climate change, the more metals which are made in Europe, in particularly places with low carbon footprint and electricity like Slovakia, the better. The less that's made in China, the better. So that's kind of... and mm-hmm. But the perverse thing that's happening is Chinese production is dramatically increasing and European production is going down. So that's that's the paradox, but that's the, the market reality. But we already have a bureaucratic solution of this issue, which is called a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Yes. So in theory, that would make sense. But C- can you can you sl- explain sh- a few words? Yeah. What it is. So carbon border adjustment mechanism, and uh, we say CBAM in Brussels language. C-BAM. This <laughs> this simple idea is we're going to tax carbon at the border. Yeah. So the imports, pr- imports. Imports. So mm-hmm. that and you know theoretically it makes sense. You know what's coming in from outside Europe is much more CO2 too intensive. So why don't we tax at the border and that will work. The devil is in the detail, and from what we've seen, it doesn't seem that it would work very well. That might change, but all their assessments, and you know, we've looked at this in detail, because this, you know, Chinese imports are really affecting our industry, we need to find solutions. But from what we see from the proposal, um, this will not work. And the reasons are the following. Firstly, China is 60% of the market, okay? 12% of their aluminum is based on hydro. They can just send that to Europe. Of mm-hmm. course they can. Why would they send their coal? They say, okay, I'll just send my hydro to Europe. Then what they do is they send the low carbon aluminum to Europe and the 88% they sell elsewhere. But the uh, British uh, Brussels bureaucrats would say and say, you have to tell us the average CO2 costs of your aluminum. We are not interested in a hydro produced. No, because the WTO, World Trade Organization rules, stipulate, or that's what we Brussels is saying. They're saying... We're not going to, we will take the average. So the default is the average. But on, under WTO rules, according to the Brussels uh, policymakers, um, the, you still have to have the right to be able to declare that you're producing a more low CO2 footprint. So we will say for China, this is your default, which is, you know, <laughs> 88% coal. But then the hydro producers will say, actually, I have a right to get into the market under WTO rules and I come up with my documentation and they will get in. Yeah. yeah, that's that's just one example. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's just mm-hmm. that that's one example. Uh, there's also many other reasons why we don't think this this will work. Uh, if you want to export outside the EU, there seems to be at the moment there's no system for rebate, and also it's very complex. But what we discussed earlier with the indirect carbon costs, it's very hard to charge that to someone outside Europe. So we can charge the emissions coming into Europe. But if you're a Slovak producer of aluminium and you face a high indirect cost, that's not linked to your indirect emissions. So how you charge that in a carbon border just mechanism is extremely complex. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, <laughs> legislation is, is always very tricky, but when you take a problem and you try and work through it, you just see how complex it is, you know. I think it was famously Lyndon Johnson says there's two things you never want to see being made legislation and sausages just mm-hmm. how how tricky it is you know mm-hmm. so that's mm-hmm. just that's just an example so good in practice it seems not to or good in theory it seems not to work in practice is our initial reaction yeah so it's possible that uh, the eu will actually in the future move towards maybe some more stricter tariffs uh, on aluminum but the, on chinese aluminum but the question then is uh, okay this this may kind of let's call it solve the problem uh, for the for the internal european market but of course on the international market uh, still uh, the european uh, aluminum or other makers will have to compete with the chinese and other so uh, how important is the the internal market for the european producers and how much do they export yeah so the the complicated thing with non with non ferrous metals and we're quite unique is we are a global price industry we're what you call a price taker yeah So it's a bit like oil. Yeah, you've won price. For, you yeah. have it's commodity. You've won price for oil. Yeah, aluminium. You have what's called the London Metal Exchange. It's the same for all the metals. Same with copper. Same with nickel. In the London Metal Exchange, you have the price. That's the price for aluminium that day. Okay, and you compete globally against everybody. Transport costs are less than one percent. So mm-hmm. transport costs are kind of negligible. It doesn't matter. You can transport the good wherever you want. So what that means is you compete every day against Chinese, against Indian, against Brazilian, Qatari producers 
the buyer of aluminium, they don't care if you face a CO2 cost, yeah? And the CO2 cost at 30 euros a ton is 20% of that aluminium sales price. Well, once again? It, at 30 euro, it's 19% of the sales price. Mm -hmm. When you go to 63 euro, which we have today. Th that's current price of the CO2 permit? Cur yeah, current CO2 price is 63 euro. Mm -hmm. it, it's very high at the moment. That's looking at 39% of the sales price. 39%. Yeah. That's, so that's your surcharge for that's European your surcharge. Produ production. That's from the ETS. Mm -hmm. So there's no way if there's not an indirect compensation that you can pass it on to the customer mm -hmm. and stay competitive. There's just mm -hmm. no way. Yeah. So, so th that's. Mm -hmm. the, I'm just saying, the fact that we're a global commodity and a price taker makes it much more complex. If I was representing cement, yeah, cement's a heavy product. Yeah, it's not like you can uh, import Chinese cement in the morning. It's not going to replace Slovak cement. There's maybe some competition with Turkey mm -hmm. at the border, mm -hmm. some place at the border. Because the transport costs are too it, high share of the price. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for metals, which are light and uh, transport costs are less than 1%, globally traded, the risk of what we call carbon leakage, so leaving Europe and going to areas where there's more CO2, is, is very real. It's, it's a phenomenon which is or exists. Mm -hmm. Of course, not I, that I would vote for it, but for example, if the EU decides to generally wall in and say, okay, we are resigning on the international market, but we are not letting any aluminium or copper from outside into EU, would it mean that uh, the industry... would be excluded from WTO. Uh, yeah, so probably <laughs> that would break uh, WTO, uh, and probably it wouldn't be enough for the home produ for the European producers just to play on the on the home field. Yeah, well, we support our sport free trade, fair trade. Your iPhone here, that has... It's Android. Android, <laughs> sorry. Well, this has at least over 20 complex metals, yeah? Which, it's a very complex, they come from all over the world, yeah? You have the raw material as well. If you're going to try and set up a fortress, Europe is not going to work because given the complexity of all these things, you know? So, in theory, I can understand the logic, but no, just the way metals work, and it's not going to be the case that you're going to be able to do something on a on a heavy metal and then that the, the small and niche metals will be allowed to transport. It, it doesn't work like that. So in general, we need um, open trade. And it's also it's important to understand, for example, in Slovakia, I think you have an important car industry. I think uh, mm -hmm. I think this kind of basin with, uh, with Hungary is very important for cars. Obviously, aluminum is a key component of cars, you know. So you don't want the the raw material of aluminium get too expensive, that would affect your car industry, et cetera, et cetera. So there's value chain impacts as well. So yeah, that's uh, again, good in theory, but in practice. So you can you can work. ban imports of uh, raw aluminium or raw copper, but then you had to ban uh, the the products which contain copper and you have to go up, up, up and wall completely the EU out, uh, out of the world. While I was uh, thinking about uh, these carbon leakage, uh, because uh, for Slovak labor market, mm -hmm. the industry is, uh, industrial production is crucial because uh, m more than 25% of people are employed by uh, in the industrial production and, and uh, all other uh, parts of economy like transportation, uh, recreational services are depending on, 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 indirectly depending on industrial production. And industrial um, production pays higher wages and, and is a leader of uh, economy. So uh, th th that's why uh, this discussion is important for Slovakia, th this carbon leakage. What if these factories leave? And uh, uh, we, are we might be afraid that the aluminium production will, for these reasons, can leave uh, Slovakia. But uh, fortunately, or fortunately, this is not... Uh, such uh, labor-intensive uh, production, but we have uh, steel production in Košice, a very huge factory, U.S. steel. But we have uh, heard uh, some uh, talks that uh, it is possible to change the way of production of steel from coke. So uh, do you think it's possible within, uh, I don't know, next five or ten years to uh, go through this transition? Yeah, so first I say, I don't represent steel, so I'm not such an expert, but I do know a bit of their processes because I, I work with them. So simplifying here, uh, in steel, you tend to have two different routes. Yeah, You have kind of the vertical route and then you have the electric arc furnace route. 
electric arc furnace is more towards like aluminium in terms of it uses much more electricity. So I don't know the individual discussions on US steel and what the plans mm -hmm. are, but I would imagine they would they would switch from what's the vertical route, carbon intensive, to the electric arc furnace route. And that's what we see happening elsewhere in Europe. What industries are doing is basically they're electrifying. That's something which non-ferrous metals has done um, already. That's something we switched our processes 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if I speak of zinc, you know, zinc has switched fully to electricity now, which is a good thing because you can decarbonize electricity. We need under other industries to do the same. So we would want steel and the chemical sector, which are kind of the big emitters, to maybe switch from carbon to electricity. And I would imagine what's being discussed with US steel is, is something along those lines. So now, because they are producing huge direct emissions, mm -hmm. uh, they receive some uh, carbon permits for free, some of them they have to auction. So they're facing a cost of direct emissions and they would switch to cost of indirect emissions. Yes. So are they motivated to make the change? Well, what we say is we need to make electricity more competitive in Europe. Yeah, because just as you said, the incentives are not there to switch from carbon to electricity sometimes given the, the framework. So in Slovakia, if the compensation scheme is not adequate, it's not a good incentive. So as I was saying, if we want to incentivize the industry to electrify, we need to have competitive electricity prices. Indirect compensation is an important part of that. You know, I represent also the mining sector. You know, in mining, there's huge projects to electrify mining in Sweden, but you're going to use huge amounts of electricity. I'm talking one third of the overall Swedish demand for of electricity for one mine. That's what we're looking at. That just gives you a, a feel of what we're looking at. But if electricity is too expensive, then it's not in the interest of the industry to do it. So electrify, but ensure that the regulatory costs of electricity are not too high. That's what I would. That's what I would say. Is the answer in uh, nuclear power? Um, I have to speak as my association. We're neutral on every source. Basically, we think that uh, electricity needs to be globally competitive. Um, and what the sources are, we let the sources compete. If I speak in a personal capacity, I'm convinced we need nuclear. I think that uh, having carbon-free source, which is stable, secure, and can which can deal with base load, Mm -hmm. When I speak of base load, your aluminum smelter runs 365 days a year, 24-7. We need base load supply electricity. Wind and solar, uh, and we sometimes we do contract with them, they're intermittent sources, and it makes it very difficult to balance. Nuclear is a base load supply. It's not as cheap as it used to be. When it was first came, we said it would be too cheap to meter. It's not that cheap. It depends where it is. But I do think that we will have a big role. I think we'll have a big reversal. I think the world will definitely get more pro-nuclear as things develop. Do, do you see some future in hydrogen projects? Yes, I think hydrogen has a lot of potential. But 80% of the cost of hydrogen is what? Do you know? It's electricity. <laughs> yeah. So again, we're going to need huge amounts of electricity to power the hydrogen. And then when we go into details of hydrogen, we'll need green hydrogen, which is hydrogen powered by wind or solar, or yellow hydrogen, which is nuclear, and um, the more kind of blue hydrogen, which is gas or, you know, fossil fuels, that's something which we're, I guess, policymakers are trying to move away from. So yes, I think hydrogen's potential, but don't forget 80% of it is electricity. So mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. just just gives a... So, okay, I would, I would like to switch to uh, maybe more interesting and funny topic. Uh, this is very interesting. <laughs> re regarding uh, political perspectives, uh, uh, European Commission or representatives of European Union, they um, describe their uh, uh, aims and, and their goals uh, as to uh, Europe should be a leader uh, in the world uh, in decarbonization. And uh, it is presented like uh, if we are the leaders, then the other countries will follow. Uh, we already heard that China said uh, we can become uh, carbon neutral in 2020, 2060. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what are your thoughts about it? Uh, is, is when, when China says oh, we are going to decarbonize in 2060, uh, is it true promise or is it just uh, their strategic game? 
Okay, so there's a kind of a few questions there. Firstly, on Europe, yes, we've gone for climate neutrality by 2050. We should be aware that that's, that's what the citizens wanted. You know, we had elections in 2019 for European Parliament and for the for new kind of leaders in the commission, etc. And the citizens said, we want climate ambition. Okay, so... Well, do you, know, do you know what was the turnout in Slovakia for the <laughs> European <laughs> Parliament? So <laughs> that's... I'm not going to go into the democratic deficit. <laughs> that's, that's a very fair point. I, I acknowledge that. That's a very fair point. But I, I just... I should say that they were elected on a climate basis and even... Uh, Ursula von der Leyen, who's the president of the commission, and Timmermans, who's uh, in charge of Green New Deal, they had to go in front of the parliament and say, we will be ambitious on climate because that's what the MEPs, so the mm-hmm. members of parliament, demanded. Um, so that's kind of what the track we've set. Uh, in general, I think history is never short of leaders. It's followers are the problem. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> There's been lots of people who have declared themselves a leader. It's getting followers is the problem. Mm-hmm. So then followers... Um, We've been very committed to this as Europe, and we've set the target. We say we're going to go and try and do this no matter what. We're, you know, our action is no longer contingent on progress outside of Europe, yeah? which is a very big risk. So before we were saying, we will do this, we will go to, 30, we will go to 40% if the others do this. Now we're saying we're going for this, and that's what we want. Okay? China has said that they will come with climate neutrality by 2060. But, you know, they're still building coal plants in China, yeah? Uh, I, don't, I think in Slovakia you're getting rid of all coal yeah, yeah, by 2023. Yeah. 20, yes, or, yes. So, you know, it's a big difference. They're building new coal plants. You're getting rid of it in a couple of years, yeah? There is a discrepancy between what is being said and then when you dig deep into the plans. Uh, I hope China uh, does achieve climate neutrality by 2060 or 2050. Uh, but you have to be skeptical based on what's out there so far. But we should say it is progress. And we also have to acknowledge that, you know, China, India, these developing countries to come from a different position. So, yeah, we'll, we'll, have, to, we'll have to see. But, um, yeah, we'll have to see. We have the Glasgow discussions uh, later this year. Do you expect any uh, new uh, targets or, or new goals or new... No, I... I I don't know. What I would like to see, what I want is a global carbon price. Yeah, very simple. So if everybody, we face a carbon price in Europe, which I said was six three euros a ton. If everybody faced that, things would be much simpler. So I would like at least a commitment to carbon pricing and a commitment to bringing it in sooner rather than later. So can you impose the same carbon price for European and five times poor Indian? Same price? Is it possible? Um, that's, so that's a good discussion. So then there's the idea of developing countries. Should they be treated differently? And there is some, you know, we have that in WTO. There is a developing country system. China is now, a, you know, it's at a more advanced stage. Same with India. And especially industry, that's what we compete. So I would say it's certainly in terms of the metal sector. Yes, it should be a level playing field. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. That's what I would say. But still, I think there are the policy deficits at home because uh, there is kind of a schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. For example, in Slovakia, for the past, I think, 12 years, we spent 4 billion euro subsidizing renewables. 4 billion euro for Slovakia is quite a lot of money. And we didn't get a lot of renewables for this money. I mean, the big uh, hydro, it's been there for the past 50 years. It's not coming from this. It did not add much, it cost a lot. During the same time, we were also subsidizing the coal-powered power mm-hmm. plant, which costed like over 1 billion euro. If, if you didn't subsidize this power plant, which is making electricity from lignite for very low quality lignite, and it's actually just making smoke, it's not making much, uh, you would save a l- much more uh, carbon than uh, with this very expensive 4 billion scheme to add renewables. Take Germany, they closed a lot of nuclear power plants mm-hmm. because of political decision. I mean, most big part of it was replaced, uh, at least on some margins, by, again, uh, gas. gas and also coal power plants, or by survival of coal power plants. So, again, I, I have a feeling that uh, the EU and some national governments are making uh, very expensive decisions to get some carbon benefit 
And on the other hand, on the, in the same time, they are uh, doing very expensive decisions, which uh, prevents even more uh, carbon uh, to be uh, to be saved. So I think there is still deficit also in this way. I would agree fully. I think I think it's essential to decarbonize power. I think everyone would agree that. Then the question is, what's the most efficient way to do it? Um, and I think there's been maybe an ide- ideological position that we want to promote renewables. What I would say is you put a price on CO2 in electricity and then you let the market decide. And if that's more nuclear, you know, if it's gas, whatever it is, the market should decide. What we did was we pumped a lot of money into wind and solar, which maybe they needed something to start from a low base. You know, they're starting from a low base to, to kind of catch up and start producing. But what we ended up doing, as, as, you, <laughs> as you pointed out, is we produced this, then we had an increase in coal, less gas. It was a mess, and a lot of money was wasted there. So I think the big takeaway from that is let the market decide. Yeah, you put a price on CO2 mm-hmm. and let the market decide. I don't think, I think we should be technological neutral. Mm-hmm. So let the market decide and not necessarily give advantages to wind and solar. They should compete against all other resources. That's how I would see it. Yeah. Any more questions, Radovan? Uh, well, I think this is a beautiful uh, final comment. Did you have already the dinner or <laughs> you are hungry? <laughs> no, no, no. But uh, I'm very uh, look forward to uh, I don't Haluski, Haluski or uh, whatever the, the Slovak dish is. Uh, Will we serve to tourists? <laughs> <laughs> okay, forward. thank you very much, Kilian. Thank you. And uh, for the viewers, Kilian, we will tomorrow. Uh, for you it's uh, the 19th of September uh, talk on uh, our conference uh, about uh, the energy and the impact of decarbonization on the Slovak industry so we are looking forward to it I hope you you enjoyed it and thank you again uh, for coming to our vlog slash podcast oh, it was my pleasure and thanks very much for the for the invitation thank you thank you thank you, thank you.